section. So the Beatitudes. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Thanks, Lorraine. It's, um, I think of the most difficult fu- funeral, or I can think of two difficult funerals that I became involved in, and uh, one was uh, a young couple who, for, we- for years, had worked on uh, IVF in order to have a, have a baby. And uh, there was grief month after month after month when the IVF uh, didn't work. And But bang, then one day the, they became pregnant and a baby was born and great rejoicing. Until five months later, I took the funeral for a cot death. And I remember battling to hold my own tears back when, when that happened. I can remember another occasion when a, uh, another young man discovered that his wife was having an affair. And uh, so he went home to get his uh, shotgun and unfortunately, uh, the shot, fortunately the shotgun had been hidden. So he went to his friend and his friend was stupid enough to give him his shotgun. So he went along and uh, shot the, the lover and then shot himself. Now, could you imagine the atmosphere at that funeral where you've got the, the wife who's grieving at the loss of the husband and the loss of her very close friend. We've got the families, uh, both families there, and they're also very angry. And the atmosphere was very, very tense. And like Jack, as a young minister, it really tested all that I had uh, to lead that funeral. And when we see that, we, we see the words of Jesus, happy are those who mourn, or blessed are those who mourn. I'm not too sure about that. I'm not too sure about that. And we need to get inside and try and work out what Jesus meant by that. For they shall be comforted. Well, those of you who have been through it, you know that when you go through a funeral, when you lose someone close to you, and some of you have done that, it's a heart-rending grief. And you wonder, you, you miss your partner more than when you're doing the washing up. I'm sure, I'm sure Jack was uh, talking about the conversations that happened when they were washing up. Uh, but when you see that, you see that it's absolutely hopeless. But you ask yourself whether God can use those tragedies. Whether as we move on, uh, we, we start to recover from the, the devastation that, that occurs. Now... I talked last week that in the room today we have people who have been widows and widowers and you've all worked your way through this. But grief is more than that. Blessed are those who mourn. Uh, Do you remember the day that uh, your children decided not to go on holidays with you? Do you remember the day the children moved out? Uh, Do you remember the uh, illness and the fact that you were disabled for quite a while? Uh, Do you remember when a pet died? And even though it's a dog, and people mourn over their cats, I don't know why, but they do. Well, even when that happens, <laughs> you discover that it's terrible, terrible the grief that is accompanied with that. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, says the psalmist, I will fear no evil. And then he goes on to say, there is recovery. 
Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I wonder if we've found God to be there. I was very interested. Now Marge found a, a friend of ours at Bayview Church. She lost her husband three years ago. And uh, she put this little thing on, uh, on Facebook. You might know her. Uh, Today marks three years since my beloved Warren went to be with the Lord in heaven. It had been the hardest three years of my life, learning to live on my own without my soulmate and best friend. I miss that wonderful belly laugh that was so contagious and would set everyone into fits of laughter. He was such a fun guy to be around and always saw the positive side of life. But this is the part. Through my grief... God has been working in my life and that now I can say through this agony, God has given me joy through my sorrow after being challenged to ask God for it. When will I ever feel normal again? I don't know, but I know that my strength comes from God. Now, it's interesting, when people lose something very close to them, their dog or cat or husband or wife or whatever. Some people become very angry. And we, we hear so often, I've heard it so often in pastoral work, I no longer believe in God because my 105-year-old mother died. And those type of people have been brought up on false promises that life will be just smooth all the way through. You've heard me say this before, but life is not like that. It's a scenic railway. And even as you go back to Psalm 23, you discover that goodness and mercy shall follow me. I shall walk in in, uh, beautiful places, but also there's a shadow of death as well. And you see that life is a scenic railway. There are ups and downs. And what difference does Christianity make? I believe that the bumps aren't quite as acute in our Christian life. And when we uh, experience God in those times of grief, we discover that there is a constant joy as well. Blessed are those who mourn. Is this what Jesus meant? Blessed are those who mourn. They shall regain hope. They shall regain strength. And God will be there during the dark times. And as many of you have said to me, when you've lost someone close to you, life has to go on. Is that what Jesus meant? Well, what do we learn when that happens? Blessed are those who mourn. And you wonder whether they're going to lose, learn something through this process. I was talking to a couple, I went to see them in the hospital years ago, and they were having, he was having bypass surgery. And uh, it was in the early days, and you know, it was a bit of a climax in, in life. And I said, well, I, I want to pray with you guys before you go, he goes into surgery, and uh, what would you like me to pray about? And the answer was very unusual. They said, we'd like you to pray that we might learn from this experience and we might be able to help others through it. And I thought, that's different to what I've ever heard before. Might it be a learning experience? When you go through grief, when you lose something or someone close to you, it seems like no one else really understands. And those of you who are widows or widowers, You know that six months after the funeral and uh, the phone stops ringing and uh, the people forget about anniversaries, they forget uh, about birthdays and at the meal time there's a conspiracy of silence so we won't talk about the deceased because we don't want to upset mum or or dad. And you've experienced that. And I also pointed out last week that separation and divorce is far worse than that because people don't want to talk about it. There's an element of grief that people accumulate for themselves uh, when there's been a divorce as well. But when we go through that, we do learn. Years ago, there was a uh, film put out called The Doctor, and it told the story of a uh, Ed Rosenbaum, a uh, surgeon who was one of those surgeons who didn't get on well with people. You know those type of surgeons? And uh, yeah, didn't get on well with his wife, didn't get on well with his family, didn't get on well with his patients, didn't get on well with his staff, didn't get on well with the hospital either. He was a grump. And uh, it came the day that he had to go into hospital. And he had to sit in a waiting room. 
He had to put on the white gown that didn't button up down the back. And he had to do with all those things. And in the film, he gets, he's given an enema that was meant for the person next door to him. And he wasn't too happy about that either. And, and you, you see them going through this. And through the story, he develops a friendship with a woman who's dying. And she taught him so much about empathy and compassion. And the book that Bo Rosenbaum wrote was A Taste of My Own Medicine. And through that experience, he emerged as a far more compassionate surgeon. You see, we do have to laugh, learn to laugh, die, and laugh and mourn. Ecclesiastes says that. There's a time to mourn, there's a time to laugh, and there's a time to cry. And uh, one Arab said, very wisely, that if it's all sunshine, it is a desert. Look, I know that grief can destroy. I know that it can drain us of hope, but there is also can shape us to be more compassionate as well. Then Jesus goes on to say, they shall be comforted. Notice the future. They shall be comforted. Now, is it saying that this blessing will not be known in this life? Now, I was talking before last week about the uh, Negro spiritual attitude that says, life's miserable now, but in the next life we'll have a fellowship with God and it will be absolutely marvellous. Now, I'm not too sure what this form this fellowship with God will be like, but I do know, as I read the New Testament, particularly, not so much the Old Testament, but the New Testament, there's a not yet aspect to living. There's a future there that goes beyond the grave. Its form I'm not too sure about. Now, that makes a difference to the way that we face life. There's always the element of hope. And Paul said to the Thessalonian church, you should not grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so will it be for those who die in Christ. A few years ago, we had a uh, student at Wollongong, uh, part of our uh, campus of the Sydney College of Divinity. And uh, she was an Anglican lady. And I noticed that uh, her grades were dropping. And uh, she did come and see me and said, oh, I'm thinking of dropping out of uh, studying for a Bachelor of Theology. And why is that? Well, she said, I want to be ordained. And I'm part of the Sydney Diocese of the Church of England and uh, the Anglican Church and they will not ordain me. And so there was not a nut yet aspect in front of her until she realised that the Goulburn Diocese, which was a more, much broader diocese, would ordain her. And suddenly she sparked up. Her grades went up and she worked fervently towards the end of her degree. And you start to see that when there's a future aspect, it makes a huge difference to us. Now... I know that that future aspect doesn't make much difference to pain and uh, the pain of mourning. It's almost a year, it is almost a year to the day that I had a knee operation, uh, knee replacement. Now, if you've ever offered one of those, I'd either say I'll have amputation or can we do the hip instead. Don't, 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 let, don't let them touch your knee. And uh, it's pain. I've never experienced pain like it. Far worse than childbirth. <laughs> and I, I watch them call the midwife. That's how I know. <laughs> now, I lay there in bed. They come and sort of tell me they're going to move and take me down to rehab. And I said, I don't want to move. And they dragged me out, put me in a wheelchair. Zoom, down I went. And uh, uh, I had to walk along these bars. I said, I can't walk. And then I saw old people, three or four weeks out from their operation, old, 83-year-old, and <laughs> they were managing. And it saw, I saw what was ahead of me. I saw hope. And I didn't become as grumpy as I had been, and it lifted up my spirits and made me work at rehab. And when we see the future, when we see the future, whatever it is, and we know that there's going to be recovery, we know that there's, a, if you like, a life beyond, it makes a difference to the present. And probably when Jesus was right, uh, said these words, he knew that the church would be under persecution. And probably that's why Matthew preserved it. Blessed are those who mourn. It's going to be tough, guys, he's saying to the church. But we shall experience God's comfort. 
The chatbot uses memes. Some say, no, no, that's not what it is. He says, rather it is, blessed are those who mourn for the sins of the world. Blessed are those who look around and feel as if the world is not what it should be. And we switch on a television, and I don't know if it happens to you, but we see what's happening in Israel and Gaza and Ukraine, as Marge mentioned in her in prayer. And you want to switch off the TV. We've become inoculated, if you like, to the pain and the suffering and misery and injustice that is happening in, in our world at, the, at this moment. Now, we shouldn't allow that to happen. And not only us, but when I think of funeral directors who are handling funerals every day of the week, they become inoculated as far as they're seeing people who are grieving. Or I think of first responders, police and ambulance people, who go to the scene of an, a, a wreck and they feel as if, oh, just another one. And sometimes as ministers you need to watch that as well. When we need to practice a certain detachment, but in practicing detachment you can lose the sense of compassion. And we can take, if you like, sin for granted. Do you know what I think the greatest sin of the world is at the moment? The aspect of the right to life. And I'm not talking about abortion here. And it's interesting that uh, my colleagues in the United States are very strong against abortion and very pro-gun. I, I can't work that one out quite. But when we look around, we see people's lives just being destroyed, whether Israel or Gaza. When you look at history, the, the evils of the Second and First World War, nor the Second World War, was the taking of civilian life. You look at Dresden, you look at uh, East London, Berlin, uh, Auschwitz, Hiroshima, uh, Armenia in the First World War. And some of those things that are happening that distress us today are nothing compared to what's happening in Africa at the moment. The right to human life is something that is, I feel, the greatest sin that is around today. And what Jesus is saying, don't lose your sense of compassion. Don't become inoculated. Perhaps he's saying, blessed are those who mourn for the sake of the world. Be aware of what is happening. Or does Jesus mean something else? Blessed are those who mourn for the lost. And we're talking about evangelism. We're talking about the first thing that cools in a church's agenda. The, the, the wish to see people come to a relationship with Christ. And as we look around the world, we see warfare, we see hatred, we see addiction, we see... But when we start thinking about it, there's also another form of being lost. There's another form of sin. When people lose hope, when people are overwhelmed by their past, where forgiveness is not known. <laughs> I was listening, I was driving over on uh, Wednesday morning to the men's thing, and I was listening to the ABC on the radio, and uh, uh, they were talking about things that have caught up with you in the past that you've never forgotten. And I don't know if you, any, any, you, any of you heard this program, but one woman said, I remember as a young person just starting a first job, when the boss said to her, uh, would you come to my office? We need to have a talk. And she was in trouble. Right? And she said that stuck with her. Whenever any, any, ever anybody says to her, we need to have a talk, it, the old fears start coming up. And when you start thinking like that, this lady hung on to that thing. She needed help in order to let that go. And when we start thinking about that, there are lots and lots of people like that. And when we think about that, it means that the concept of salvation, it's not a word we use very often. There are people who need to be led to a relationship with Christ so that they can find hope and salvation and a future as well. And that spells itself out in what we think is important for the church. What is important for the church? Well, we like our comfort, we like our predictability, but sometimes we need to understand that the church doesn't exist for us. It's a church that needs to exist for those who don't yet come. Is that what Jesus meant? Blessed are those who mourn.